So for the second part of looking at the Industrial Revolution, its implementation in the United States and its effects, we're going to take a look at not only a new system that is going to revolutionize production and the American landscape, but also how people were able to get messages out. The concept of quick communication is going to come about. When we look at the notion of interchangeable parts, we start with Eli Whitney. Now, Eli Whitney graduated from Yale, and he went south to find work. And he found work as a tutor on a southern plantation. Now, on this plantation, he witnessed slaves using a machine to separate cotton seeds from the actual cotton, which previously had to be completed by hand. You know, you had to pick the cotton by hand, separate it by hand, and it was incredibly time-consuming. The innovation of Eli Whitney is he took the concept of interchangeable parts and applied it to the cotton gin. See, you would feed, once you close the top, you'd feed the cotton through, you'd crank it up, clean cotton would come out on the end, and the seeds would all be deposited into the bucket. Now, he was unable to gain a monopoly on manufacturing cotton gins, so he opened up a gun factory in Connecticut and applied the concept of interchangeable parts to musket production. That business failed as well. So as an innovator, he was very competent. As a businessman, eh, not so much. But interchangeable parts is definitely still with us today. It's the reason why if there's something wrong with a car, you take it to the mechanic or you look at it and you fix the part. You look for a part to fix, not the entire thing. That's interchangeable parts. So we're figuring out how to more efficiently utilize and produce things. Now, John Deere and Cyrus McCormick, along with Eli Whitney, really exemplify the attitude of the early to mid-1800s. Mechanical know-how is the most important asset when it comes to innovation. It's really no different than in the modern day, where if you have technical know-how, like if you understand coding and computers, that's often an important skill to have when you innovate new technologies. Now, when we look at how to produce food more efficiently, produce more of it in a quicker way, we look at the notion of the metal plow. John Deere used his skill as a blacksmith to forge a plow out of steel, the steel plow instead of wood in the late 1830s. And it was more efficient for tilling land on what was called the frontier. You know, John Deere is from Illinois, which was the frontier at the time. But this is going to be critical in farming on the Great Plains as well. So you got John Deere's metal plow. You have Cyrus McCormick's mechanical reaper. McCormick was 22 years old when he developed this. A two-wheeled horse-drawn chariot for harvesting grain. We can produce food quicker, more efficiently, without as many workers. You don't need as many field hands to harvest food because of innovations like the plow and the reaper. So we can produce more efficiently. We also can communicate more efficiently. Now, the telegraph is often attributed to Samuel Morse, and Samuel Morse was a professor of fine arts who was actually more known for his paintings than anything. Now, Morse and his team were given money to lay a wire from Baltimore to Washington, D.C. Their first step, their first thought was to try and lay it underground, but there were problems with insulating it. So they strung it up on poles above ground. Imagine telephone wires. That's the type of wire that we're talking about here. You'd have wires on poles above the ground for these messages. Now his very first message in 1844 simply read, What hath God wrought? 
a biblical message. And this new invention allowed for up-to-the-minute reports on the national conventions that were taking place that year to nominate candidates for the presidency. Now to say the world is connected is an understatement. This is going to be what allows us to go from coast to coast. Messages can be transmitted from east to west in a fairly quick period of time. And it was often said that when the railroads went up, you knew that telegraph wires were coming up the next day. You often would see these telegraph wires directly next to the railroads. So we can produce quicker, we can communicate quicker. Now on this idea of producing quicker, we look at Francis C. Lowell and his innovation of mass production of textiles or cotton cloth. Now he's a businessman in New England and he believes based on his personal experience with the Embargo Act. So this is when we weren't trading with anyone. This is the end of Jefferson's presidency. We're not trading with anyone. He believed that the United States needed to manufacture their own goods instead of remaining dependent on Europe. So this is where he would agree with that part of Henry Clay's American system. Now, he did travel to Britain with his family for a two-year period. And remember, you can't purchase blueprints of any power looms. You can't get a hold of this technology because it's a state secret. What he did was he secretly studied the spinning and weaving machines of the region. He went to areas of Scotland. He went to areas in northern England where they were producing, and he studied the machines. Now, he and his family had their personal belongings searched when they crossed the Atlantic. So he and his family are in Great Britain for two years. They travel back to the United States. Halifax is what we would call the port of entry, and Halifax is in Canada. The War of 1812 was about to break out, so the British authorities searched his belongings. But he had nothing that the British could take because he memorized all of the designs. Now, I'll say that again because it's worth repeating. Francis C. Lowell memorized the designs of these British machines, so the Brits couldn't take anything. Two years later, he and his two business partners had constructed and they had demonstrated that a water-powered loom would work. Now, four years after he died, you know, he died in 1817, four years later, his business partners got an idea. Why not build a special town that would house one of their mills? Because if you build the mill and build the town around it, your workforce can live there and walk to work. Plain and simple. Now, for the initial labor force, they relied on young women in southern New England. Remember, this industrial revolution first begins in southern New England. There's a lot of good conditions there with the water uh, to power the mills, easy transportation, but there are a lot of young women in southern New England because there's still a lot of farm families that have many children, and many of the young men of the region had already gone west. And most immigrants were heading west. They're not settling in New England anymore. So that kind of explains why they primarily had young female workers. And we can tie this in to the chart here, this, this idea of what we might call the wage gap or the glass ceiling, depending on who you ask, where men traditionally earn more than women for similar jobs. And part of this can be explained by the fact that women didn't have many opportunities available to them to work outside the home. So this, you know, this idea, this Lowell system, we call it, where you have the mill and you have the town surrounding it and you mass produce something, anytime that, well, anytime you have something that works, everyone wants to duplicate it. 
doesn't matter if it's sports, business, education, whatever. If it works, other people want a piece of the pie. So now shoes are going to be mass produced. You know, leather, wagons, anything. This is why goods today are mass produced. It's based on these methods. And it's also based on the work of Lowell and his associates. Now, it might seem kind of strange to have an entire town based on one factory or one industry, but the planners had this in mind. The Mill Girls, as they kind of came to call themselves, they were recruited. They're recruited to travel to and work in Lowell, and they had to provide their labor for at least one year. So for at least one year, they had to work in these mills, and they often had very unsanitary conditions and very long hours. Now the flip side to this is that the town would house girls in dormitories. They're basically living in a dorm when they're not working, so they could form friendships with other girls or women like themselves. They can network with other women. And it's not as if this town consisted of a factory and dorms. There were shopping centers, all right? There was a library, social opportunities, and there was a local newspaper that these girls contributed to. That's where the amenities come in. Amenities are additional opportunities for leisure time. Many equated it with freedom. You know, this was the first time for many young women that they left their family farm for a long stretch, and they enjoyed this. Now, the public was kind of okay with this system because the environment was isolated, and most girls only stayed a few years until they got married. This is actually going to serve as a model or a template for the company towns that are going to come in the future. So company towns that are based on like a paper mill or a railroad or a coal mine, they have their roots in the Lowell system and, of course, the town of Lowell, Massachusetts.